his hands. And he was sent to proclaim the word of the Lord's judgment, and he knew the Lord warned him, you're going to get a hostile reception from these people. But he went and did what the Lord had told him to do, and then he got that hostile reception and began to complain about the fact that he was getting a hostile reception. In other words, he thought, maybe the Lord would make it go easier on me than he said it would be. And I think sometimes we share that same kind of attitude with Jeremiah. We think in our hearts that if we prayed hard enough, we prayed long enough, and done the right thing and always at the right time, that somehow the life we live should be easier than it might be currently. Feel like the face of Jesus has been clouded over a bit, like the picture on the front of the bullet you see in the game, like he's growing less and less and fading into the background. Jeremiah felt that way, and that doubt was for him a sin, as it would be for any of us. The Lord responds to that by calling him to repentance and then re-establishing, renewing the promises that he made to him. I will enable you to stand will remain steadfast. Hear now from Jeremiah 15, 15 through 21. You understand, O oh Lord. Remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me. You had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails? That's an accusation leveled at the Lord and at his promises. That is a sin. Listen to the Lord's response. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you. You must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. If any things fight against you in this day and age, may have a personal battle that you're engaged in right now. And it may strike you that the Lord is not being fair with you. You might even raise up such an accusation to the Lord. Be careful how you appeal to him. Not as one who owes you an explanation or owes you anything but his promise of salvation. But your enemies, if you speak his word, cannot overcome you. Remain steadfast to the promises of the Lord what he says will be true. I will redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. Now we have Paul's words to the Roman Christian congregation, 12, 1 through 8. And here, as God had given to Jeremiah this basic statement, you're going to have to sacrifice yourself. You're going to have to go through a lot for me if you're going to proclaim my word to this hostile nation. So here, now listen carefully. As Paul urges all of us to adopt the same attitude. Okay? We are to be living sacrifices. Every moment of every day devoted to living for the Lord, speaking His word clearly when we have opportunity to, and working through with His power and strength, whatever may come our way in a given day. In Romans 12, 1 through 8, how to live as a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves, your bodies, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Please notice these two paragraphs. First focus on the mercy of God that has been given to each of us, to you, through Jesus Christ.
Christ our Lord. Second paragraph, a call to sanctification, to renew your efforts to live according to God's word. You can only do that, that transformation can only take place by studying the word of God and applying it to life. Now this beautiful third paragraph, which informs each and every one of you, you have a role, you have a gift that God has given you to invest in the work of his mission. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully.
forfeits his soul. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? The Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So also a prediction of the resurrection, when all that was promised is fulfilled, when he stands in the upper room and says, not you mouthy bunch of deserting idiots, but peace be with you. The kingdom of God has come. Please join me in our next hymn. God himself be formed. 419, notice verse 1, 5 to 7. 1, 5 to 7.
acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. Are our redeemer. I don't know if, if any doctor really would say this, but someone told me that a doctor actually said this to her. She was in a wheelchair. She had gone through a very difficult surgical procedure. She was miserable in her pain. And there was no certainty that further surgical procedures would not be necessary. The personal doctor is escorting her back to her room. And she looks up at him and she asks this question. Doctor, how long will I have to deal with One day at a time. One day at a time. Now, I think that in Jeremiah's case, that was probably a, a difficult thing to hear, much less pursue one day at a time. But if you follow the Lord's presentation throughout the scriptures, especially what Jesus had to say on many occasions, either the direct statement or the implication was there. One day at a time. Because none of us knows how long he or she will live, and none of us knows what tomorrow may bring. So in a certain sense, it may be a type of a call to repentance. Promises. 
Jesus has never fallen to the ground and never will be healed. But the reality is, as someone once said, if you feel that you and God are not as close as you once used to be, who moved? Time and time again, God says in his word, his son says in his word, for example, the parable of the prodigal son, father stood by the gate, waiting to embrace the returning child. Every day stood up there, watching up the road, ready to leave me back. When he does come back, I'm ready to embrace him. Sometimes we are all like prodigal children. We lose sight, as Peter did, of what Jesus is all about. Why he came, when he came, what he did, and the reason why he did it. And we begin to take that for granted. What have you done for me lately? It's been 2,000 years since you shed your holy, precious blood on the cross. Haven't come back yet. During those 2,000 years, People have been waiting and praying, begging for your return. Would now be a good time to come before I'm the next one to be beheaded? So that my endless pain can cease. So that these daily confrontations I have at work or at school can fade. And I can rejoice in being at the right hand of Jesus Christ's brothers and sisters, the believers who will enter into the resurrection.
such times, Jesus rebukes us. And he calls us back to sacrificial living. He called Jeremiah back to that. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, urged them, in view of God's mercy, to live as living sacrifices. And Jesus tells Peter and the others, you want to save your life? You will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. So in the process of being a living sacrifice, in the process of seeking discovery, the gifts that God has given to you, that you may now return to him in service to his kingdom, you will gain. You will find a satisfaction and a reward that surpasses any dark moment, minute, hour, day, week, month, year, or life. Because the bottom line is this. Isn't it true? Today, today, you know where you're going. You know. Go to heaven when you die. How can anything take such knowledge, such certainty, and suppress it and push it down so far, so much to the back of our mind? bottom of our hearts that we would rather have something, anything of what is currently troubling our hearts. We say it over and over again in our worship service. You are the children of God. You are the holy nation, the royal nation, the people who belong to him who has called each and every one of you out of darkness into his wonderful like in that way, perhaps someday you can be the doctor of someone's soul. You may hear someone talking to you and saying, How long? How long must I go through this? Must I suffer with this? Must I confront that? And you can be the doctor of your soul. Know the truth. You have been set free by the truth. You understand that the great grand truth is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You have all these treasures that consume your heart and fill your mind and fill you with joy every morning you wake up. And every morning his mercies are renewed. Think of it simply. Think of it directly. Think of how it applies to you. And say to that poor suffering soul who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb to a joy never known by anyone else except you when it's grasped firmly and taken away. Just one day at a time. That's the secret that enables you also to know that God is no one, nothing can take my joy from you. So even though the pain may be great, and the hostility constant, and the frustration with evil men doing evil things in the world, yes, every so often, of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds focused on Christ Jesus. That will lead you to life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our all.
Supper, would you please rise? This is what 1 John 3, chapter 1, 8 and 9 says. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, together with me, will you confess that in the presence of a holy God who demands perfection from us, you and I are but sinners in his sight. If that is true for you, as it is for me, say it together with me. I am a sinner in your sight, O oh Lord. I am a sinner in your sight, O oh Lord. <clears throat> the passage goes on to say, but if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You could not make that former confession of being a sinner unless the truth had a hold of your heart and the Holy Spirit was already working on you. Are you, are you also willing to admit this. Jesus Christ is Lord. And the holy and precious blood of Jesus Christ without blemish or spot has taken away the punishment for all your sins. If you can be secure and confident in this truth, the Lord has put your sins behind you and he will never hold them against you. If you believe this to be true, say together with me, I am forgiven. I am going to heaven through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now together. I am forgiven. I am going to heaven through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Is it your sincere intent to move forward from the reception of the Lord's Supper? Aware of your sins in order to correct your lifestyle. Aware of God's mercy in order to be compelled by mercy to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to take on whatever burdens may become yours, your cross, and continue to follow him, because in doing so, you gain everlasting life. If you are willing to be a humble servant of the Lord from this time forward, then say, as the first, God give me strength to serve you as a living sacrifice. God give me strength to serve you as a living sacrifice. Pastors are called by congregations with this understanding that when they are installed, they are making a promise. I know and I hold to God's word as inspired. I know and I hold to the Lutheran confessions as a correct exposition of God's word. I will hold to and honor this truth of scripture and those confessions as I serve a congregation that is called. That means that what Christ once said that applies to pastoral ministry. He who hears you, hears me. You believe that through me, when speaking the truth from God's word, it is as though Christ himself were speaking to you. And say, yes, I believe in God's work in your ministry. Yes, yes, I believe in God's word in your ministry. To hear this and know it to be true. As a called and ordained servant of God's word, in the place and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority alone, I tell you this. Your sins are all forgiven. The burden and guilt and shame has been lifted from your shoulders and tossed behind you are the children of God, in faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. With careful attention now to the words of the institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. This is what he told them. Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in the same fashion, after the supper, he took the cup of thanks in. When he had given thanks, he blessed it, and then he gave it to his disciples. This is what he told them. Take a drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink it.
bread and wine. Now in with and under the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Your faith will be strengthened. Your courage renewed. We go from this place at peace with God. Please be seated. The ushers will lead the committee this morning. We'll be seated in 311. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in with and under this bread and wine strengthen and preserve you all in the true faith and life everlasting Amen. We now depart and have peace with the Lord. Amen.
ways. First, the prayer for today to give your devout attention to the special prayers, and then we will rise. I'm sorry, Gary.
that day arrives, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you and be